Well, let's begin. Let me welcome everybody to the Future Trends Forum. My name is Murray Alexander. I'm your MC, cat herder, and host for this hour. And I'm very glad to see and hopefully hear everybody uh, here today. Our topic is the future of libraries. So before we get into the topic, let's introduce the forum, where it came from, how it works, and where it's going. So to begin with, uh, the forum is the video conference discussion-based spin-off of the Future Trends in Technology Education Report. If you don't know the report, uh, FTTE has been tracking major trends in technology and education for years now. We have a map of about 86 or so trends that we track regularly. Um, if you haven't seen it before, go to ftte.us to look at the sample copies and take a look. Now, another thing about the forum that's a little different, let's go to the next slide, please. Is that this is part of a series of projects, uh, including uh, a regular blog, the FTD report, uh, including an online book club. If you haven't seen all these, they're all together in the Future of Education Observatory. So go to futureofeducation.us and you'll be able to check out and see a whole variety of projects, including a couple that are just starting. Next slide, please. Now, another feature of the forum is that this is an international group. We have so far had participation from every continent in the world. Uh, this map is a little old, we have updated, but we have people from Africa, Asia, Australia, Europe, North, and South America. It's important we think about the future of technology and education, in particular the future of libraries, to think about it on the global stage to keep in mind the international projects. Uh, next slide, please. Now, before we go further and begin, let me just thank people who have sponsored this and makes me the technology. So, I want to thank NYSERDEN from New York State, uh, Mount Colorado, that helps network with that state's universities, colleges, museums, libraries, and hospitals. We're very grateful to NYSERDEN for their support. We're also grateful to Shindig. Um, and Shindig is responsible for providing this technology. So let me just take you through it so you can see how it works. If you haven't used it before, if you need a refresher, this is a discussion oriented platform. Uh, there are a lot of tools you have to be able to share your thoughts, ideas, and questions. Now, most of them at the very bottom of the screen. Before we get there, here at the top, where I am and where this, sorry, where the slide is, um, is the stage. Everybody who's up here can be heard by everybody who's in on the Australian conference. Everything that's up here can be seen by everybody. Now below us, where everybody else is, I think of as the participants form, you can see dozens and dozens of people, each person or each login represented by an icon, it could be a picture, like Stephen Miller, or a video feed, like Jennifer Cox. If you'd like to talk to any one of these people, simply take your icon, click on, or double-click on one of those people, and if they're up to talking with you, your two icons will click together like Lego bricks, and you have your own private audiovisual bubble. Now, if you'd like to communicate with everybody else, there are three different ways. When you go to the bottom of the screen, there's a white strip running along it, and a few very, very useful tools. On the very far left of it, you'll see a number, and it's 43. Um, that's it. We'll click on and tell you about everybody who's here in on this video conference right now. So I can quickly scroll through and see Julia Lewis, Tom Rogers, Paul, the librarian, Brenda, and so on. And that's a way of connecting and seeing who else is here. So right over that is a chat box. Now if you double click or you simply click on that, up it'll pop. And this gives you a chance to chat with the 18 or so people who come into the Trinity with you. Um, every time we get beyond that number, Trinity explores another room. So we have a series of rooms right now, and I think we have about three. Um, so you can chat and say hello to everybody there. If you want to switch rooms, just look on the very, very far right edge of the participants form and see a white chevron. If you click that, they'll pop into the next room, or just click on that number at the bottom of the screen. Now, you can also share thoughts and questions through two other buttons on the white strip. One of them is a question mark with a circle. If you click that, you'll be able to type in the single comment or question that it will pick up. Uh, and then we can display it for everyone to see, and I'll read out loud for everybody to hear. So that's a really useful way if you have a quick comment or question that you want everybody to see it here. Now, if your microphone works, if your camera works, and you're in a place where you can talk out loud, click on that raised hand. The raised hand tells us that you'd like to join us on stage. It's really easy to do that. Uh, we can fit up to four people up here on stage at any time. So we can have a nice panel, a nice conversation. So if all your technology is working, click on that and you can join us and ask questions. 
Human scene performance is really easy, and we'll show you some examples of that. So, many ways to converse, many ways to share your thoughts. Please pick the ones that are comfortable for you and share your thoughts. Now, we're very grateful, of course, to Shindig for making this technology possible. One more final bit of gratitude. Uh, I'd like to thank all of the supporters of Patreon uh, who support this work. If you haven't seen Patreon as a crowdfunding source, like uh, GoFundMe or Kickstarter, um, but people, people sign up to support a particular creator who is making something. In this case, you sign up to support my work in creating stuff for the future of education. So you can see from this slide, you know, a bunch of people who were on there, dozens actually, and they all contribute something per month, as little as a dollar, just to keep the lights on and all the machines on there. If you haven't seen it, go to patreon.com slash Alexander. Check it out, and please, if you can, support us. I'd love to hear from you. Now, this week, we have a special guest who I'm still delighted to have as a guest. We've had her as a participant before, and I've worked with her on multiple projects. This is Lisa Hinchliff. Lisa is one of the world's leading web brains. She is at the University of Illinois in Urbana Champaign, and there she does, as far as I can tell, the job of 20 different people. She has information literacy, she has outreach and inclusion, she has instruction in the library, and meanwhile, she works with all the leading library associations who every so often give her awards, I think just to try and slow her down to normal human speed. Uh, she works with the ALA, the ACML, and so on. This is a woman who is deeply, deeply involved in where libraries are going, uh, a very deep thinker about where they can go, and it is really a privilege to be able to have her with us. So let's knock these slides off the stage and bring these Hello, Brian, and thank you for those really kind words. <laughs> um, I'm a big fan, um, and I'm glad to hear you here today. Great, uh, thanks. We've been talking about libraries for a long time in the forum. We've had multiple guests who uh, come from the library world, and we've had as well libraries that pop up in all, any kind of subject. Before we dive into that, why don't you just take a minute to tell us, I'm trying to glimpse what you do. What do you do, and how do you do this? <laughs> Um, well, I feel like I, I need to fess up that right now what I am is on sabbatical. So that's oh, no. a, a particular um, oh. a lovely um, opportunity of the fact that the librarians at the University of Illinois hold faculty status. Of course, we also hold faculty responsibilities, um, including a requirement to be very active in publishing our scholarship. And so I was fortunate enough to be able to apply for and be granted a sabbatical this year um, to focus in on some of the research that I'm interested in doing, particularly on the areas of information literacy and instruction. Um, but the, it sounds like given me an opportunity as, you know, all these kinds of things do to explore quite a variety of different issues. So um, as you know, I've started writing for the Scholarly Kitchen, um, particularly looking at those issues where scholarly communication, scholarly publishing, and users um, start to interact and intersect, which I see very much as being information literacy issues. So Ooh. it's been, it's been a, 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 you know, sabbaticals are supposed to be about reflection, rejuvenation, and regrowth. And so it's, I'm not even halfway through, and it's certainly proven to be that for me this year. So. Well, yeah. when, when you're not on sabbatical and earning all of it. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. You're, you're a university librarian, and so you specialize in instruction. Uh, what we right. used to call bibliographic instruction and uh, yeah. also information mm -hmm. literacy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I mean, it, this is a rapidly changing, um, I shouldn't say changing, but it's an expanding and growing field of interest mm -hmm. because, you know, um, I, I'm thinking back to a textbook chapter I wrote, oh wow, almost 20 years ago now, where we looked at the genesis of the kind of work that I now do. And, you know, it really started with this idea of providing a library tour because, you know, where was the stuff? Um, and, you know, we can think back to that you know, the 1920s, 1930s, 1940s, and who was coming to the university. And so, of course, um, who was coming to university were definitely in the elites categories. Um, we didn't have the massification of education. We didn't have community colleges. We had a very, a very different higher ed system than we have right now, which I think some of your other guests have really talked more about. But of course, so the, the goal was like, okay, you need these kinds of books. Here's where we keep them. Here's how you get your library card. Um, very important things. And in fact, they remain very important today. So it's an interesting issue, which is 
we really haven't been able to stop teaching anything. We just keep having to add things we're teaching, which up to today at a university like mine, um, you know, there's all kinds of things that people teach um, to undergraduate students ranging from digital humanities. We have a, a very active GIS instruction program here at the library. Myself, um, the past couple of years, my specialty has really, in addition to just sort of overseeing you know, the 2000 sessions we teach a year to whoever, um, working with the librarians on professional development so they become better teachers. Um, my own area has been on doing instruction primarily for graduate students and particularly postdocs and uh, faculty on how to manage their online scholarly identity. Because with ResearchGate, Google Scholar, Academia.edu, you know, Scholarly Hub, that's different than SciHub, but Scholarly <laughs> Hub, um, you know, Microsoft Academic, I mean, all of these places are now profiling us. And how do you get on top of that and sort of use that to your advantage as a scholar? Whether you're a beginning scholar, you know, maybe you haven't even ever published anything yet, but you're starting to think about this, up to I've had people come back from retirement to my workshops because what they're trying to do is figure out how to steward their legacy. You know, they have a career's worth of work and they're sort of saying like, well, what's my obligation to the future? And how do I sort of cap my career, if you will, and say, here's what I did and, you know, here's how I contributed. So, but the other part of my job really has a lot to do with um, professional development for our teachers who teach in the library here. And so I'm a teacher of teachers in the sense more than I am of our user community. So I regularly offer what I call the instruction studio which is a three-part series where we sort of work through the process of instructional design, uh, assessment, and then uh, we stagger it such that they actually teach in the middle there. And then we have a cap off session with, okay, how did it go? And what would you do differently next time? And, and the idea of calling sure. it a studio is to really kind of say, this isn't me telling you how to teach. This is like the model of if you run like a pottery studio, right? You'd actually make pottery in order to learn mm -hmm how to make pottery. And so that's the same thing we're doing with, and that's that's why we use the term studio is we're trying to play off of that notion of um, doing? sort of learning by doing with a master coach or master teacher, if I can master teacher here. So, <laughs> yeah, that, that would be me. And we're, we have a library school here at Illinois. We're a really high ranking mm -hmm. library school. So we also have about 80 to 100 library school students working in our library. And of course, they're preparing for careers in librarianship. And so we also have extensive training programs for them, some of which I'm directly involved with and others of which I am, I support the librarians who teach those programs. So it's a big complex library, uh, you know, more than 20 locations on campus. And um, I think it was just, yeah, so it's it's a huge library. <laughs> and it's a huge university, right? You know, 40,000 right. students Famous. or so. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, so friends, when I told you that uh, Lisa is extraordinarily busy, you might not have believed me, but now you're thoroughly convinced. Uh, <laughs> instruction, scholarly communication. And just one quick note, uh, Lisa mentioned uh, that she uh, writes for the Scholarly Kitchen. If you haven't seen it, the Scholarly Kitchen is the best blog, indeed probably the best source for any discussion about new ideas and topics in the whole scholarly communication field. It's just really very, very important, really accessible, very, very exciting. Um, wow, that's a terrific background. Friends, I'm gonna ask Lisa a couple of leading questions about the future of libraries based on what she just said. Uh, so please follow up with your own questions, your own comments and thoughts about this. Um, I, I, have to, I have to start off, I guess, by asking, you teach these uh, library students I'm trying to imagine somebody who's, say, 25, um, right now in 2018, uh, they're a millennial, uh, they're almost Generation yep. Z. Mm -hmm. um, how do they, what are you telling them about how the future library will be different than it is today? Yeah, so the first thing I'm going to do is actually undo a little bit of an assumption that was in your question. Um, please, the reality please. is that quite a few library school students are not in their early 20s. <clears throat> they are in their late 20s, their mid 30s, their mid 40s. Um, and in fact, some people, it's it's the post-retirement. Um, oh. I've retired my, from my first job. And, you know, as 
as lives have lengthened and health has improved, people, you know, are looking for that next intellectual challenge. So I've had people in their 60s in some of the classes that I've taught. So having said that, I still, and actually I love that because, um, you know, that intergenerational learning community that's created when you have that kind of dynamic is very valuable. Um, people bring different life experiences, different expectations. Um, it, it really makes a very rich discussion. And mostly I teach yeah. online in the library school when I teach the credit classes that I teach, usually one or two one or two are you, you're um, online in particular, we're able to get an incredible dynamic of people because we also have people in other countries even. Um, and yeah. so some of the assumptions that, you know, things that we in the US are like, well, this is just how it is. People are like, what is that? Right. That's, mm -hmm. I've never heard of such a thing. And so you have, and you're like, really? So tell me how you do it. Like it's, it's very, very rich in that way. Your, your comment earlier on about global is very crucial. So what I really tell them about the future of libraries, and obviously my specialty is academic libraries, but I do have people from others, is that, um, you know, libraries exist in context, and they exist in, in societal context. Um, they exist in institutional context in the case of academic libraries, industry contexts. Um, we can think about the multiple overlapping industries that libraries are in. We're obviously in the higher education industry, um, but we're heavily in the scholarly communications and publishing industry. Um, we're in cultural heritage areas as well. In many cases, especially at large research universities, our rare book collections are as much um, cultural heritage as they are research collections. Um, so we are, you know, and archives are also part of it. So there's there's so many aspects, particularly in the research university setting. Um, but, I, you know, even in the smallest college library, my first job was at a community college and we had an archivist for the institution. And, you know, we had four librarians, director, two full-time public services, one tech services and an archivist. And then we had some, some part-time librarians who helped us out at the desk. But, you know, these are a lot of different roles that institutions are managing. So the big thing I also tell librarians is that future librarians is it's actually all about money. So you might, I mean, it, it's not all about money. That's not our purpose. <laughs> But all the things that we want to do are deeply embedded in financial structures, um, whether right. it's because we have to purchase things or it's because we have to convince other entities to give us money because we want to do things without charging people for them. Um, or we're trying to make the argument that actually what we want to do is an economy of scale. I mean, I would argue that libraries were, you know, a very early long standing example of economy of scale in institutions and universities. I mean, right. I mean, the whole point, those, those original reading rooms back in the, the real elite colleges and colonial times yeah. in the U S yeah. um, you know, that was so that like, there was, cause there was only one copy of the book, you know, it's not, right. we weren't right. in mass market. So, you know, this whole idea of scale and economy, I mean, that, that's what we're about. You know, we buy one copy of a book and we get 40,000 people who have access to it, or in our case, more like 60,000 once you get our researchers in it. And then libraries have led the way with what it means for to create collective impact because you see these library consortium. And mm -hmm. by doing that, we have our economies of scale grow even more. So, you know, for a given book in the state of Illinois, we have Carly, the Consortium of Academic and Research Libraries in Illinois. 94% of Illinois college students are served by a library that are in the Carly Consortium. Excellent. 94%. Excellent. Um, so we have this amazing collaborative network there within our iShare sharing system, because in Illinois, everything starts with I, the Illinois sharing system, iShare, you know, where I can on my computer look at the catalogs for all these other libraries. And within a day or two, that book will arrive here on my campus if we don't have it, or even better, let's say we have it, but it's checked out. We can still get that economy of scale by having it come from another library. Now, having just explained how we save all kind of money, you can imagine that there's another industry that we engage with that would prefer us not to be saving so much money because they would like yeah, us to be buying industry. more of their things, the publishing industry. So we sit in a very interesting nexus in, in two industries, one where we are the economy of scale and the other where we have to sort of fight for the privilege of being the economy of scale. <laughs> well, that's so. a, that's a, and the uh, ebook world, uh, in the library world, oh, has yeah. really moved against the economy of scale. So you can only have 
several copies that can be checked out at any given time uh, in order right. to try and this replicate the analog book version. Yes, yes. And of course, um, the U.S. has, I mean, in other countries, believe it or not, they don't even have the same economy of scale on the, the physical book because they still have to pay a fee that's based on the usage. In the U.S., we have the the um, right of first sale law that once you own the book, you can give right. it out as many times as you want. Well, right. with an ebook, you never own it. You rent it and um, as a library, you license it. And once we're in the world of licensing, everything is a negotiation. It's not governed by uh, the rules of purchase. And the rules of purchase are much nicer if you want to be loaning things to users than licenses. And so this is another great example where it's all about money, it's all about control, it's all about power and negotiating for all of those things. Um, I'm quite, you know, Publishers have some reasons to also want libraries to do this because it, there is research that shows, for example, that um, having a book available in a library does increase sales. Um, it might seem odd, like how does it, but it does. So, and mm -hmm. I trust the research that's been replicated a number of times, so. Well, it's partly the rent to own and partly libraries doing marketing for, uh, for publishers. Exactly. Uh, yeah, It's marketing. Yeah. And it's also, I mean, the fact that you can sort of, as a publisher, say, you can count on a certain market for a certain books. So right. basically, if you're trying to say, like, well, like, what's my, um, what's my profit loss spreadsheet? kind of thing going, you can account for in many cases, especially if we if libraries have approval plans. And for people who aren't librarians, that just means that we basically say in advance, we will buy a certain percentage of books that are published either in this genre or on this topic. Or with some publishers, we might even be like, look, if, and I'm, I'm making this up right now, if Josie Bass publishes a book on higher education, and we have a PhD program in higher education, we're buying it. Like you can right. kind of count on it. So right. they can put that into their, their plans and be like, well, we know we'll get 300 library copies sold. So they can cover their costs just with that. So as they're trying to decide, hey, Brian Alexander, do we want to write you a contract for that book? They can put into that. And so it actually means they can publish things that they might not be able to publish if they had to only sort of do their fiscal planning on the basis of individual sale predictions. So in a sense, uh, libraries get to be frenemies for publishers. But, but oh, yeah. I <laughs> and vice versa, probably. <laughs> But how do you how do you see this? How do you what we've just described as the present um, and how this mm -hmm. works? I mean, how how yeah. do you see this changing? That is, do you think we will continue to move to that rental rather than ownership model? Do you think uh, your library and students, of whichever age, uh, will mm -hmm. have to go on to be even more entrepreneurial? Uh, how do you how do you see the financial model changing? So here I'm going to have to pull back definitely into higher ed and not be talking about public libraries mm -hmm. um, because I'm, I'm just not, yeah. the, the, or special collections. And special collections are a very particular sort of uh, unique mm -hmm. thing because often with special collections, we're talking about buying things that are actually scarce, um, mm -hmm. which is a little different market than things that are not scarce. So pretty much the moment once you're distributing something digitally, it's no longer scarce in the sense that it's not limited. Um, it can be easily, well, and it's not, cons it's non-consumptive. Um, right. The fact that a publisher sells me an ebook doesn't prevent them from selling that same ebook to you because it's just duplicative. If they sell me the physical copy of a yeah. rare book, you can't buy it anymore. So, yeah. um, so we'll just leave special collections and some legacy print things to the side for a second. Um, hey, I think hey, it's hey, pretty clear. Hey, well, for yeah, one second, okay. let, me, let me just remind sure. everybody, uh, while, while you're pulling back, um, uh -huh. I'm interrogating our, our poor Lisa right now. You have many, many questions right now. I can see it depending on, on, on your faces. Uh, again, remember, if you want to uh, ask a question, use that white strip on the bottom of the screen and either click the raise hand or the uh, question mark or go in the chat box. Um, my own chat room has had some pretty frantic activity, um, and not all from Tom, um, but please um, please join in and don't let me hog the floor. 
So Lisa, you were saying you're pulling back to academic budget. So, I mean, it's, yeah. So I mean, I think it's definitely the case that as we look across higher education, um, the financial models, uh, the financial situation in higher education is um, increasingly dire and challenging. And libraries also are competing on campus for resources, um, which is the first level that is a real challenge for us. So while we're in an economy of scale and we're providing value to our institution, um, you know, so is the rec center and the research lab and the new uh, faculties, uh, media uh, production facility, and I mean, all these sorts of things. So, but, you know, clearly, as we look to the content area, there's interesting things happening. So first of all, I think that um, there are times when we actually have purchased content such that we have essentially purchased it, even if it's, I mean, so we have a back file that we have a right to. But the other issue yeah. with digital is that um, metaphorically, the printed book is its own delivery mechanism. So right. the text on the page and the page itself are essentially inseparable. This is right. not the case with digital materials in most cases. So you've got a file or multiple files that is the object, the text, if you will, whether it's media or not, but then you have a delivery platform. So even if we own the content, we still have to license or have some sort of ongoing service agreement for a delivery platform. Um, and this is one of the areas that open access is an interesting question because of course we see an, a, 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 a relatively rapidly increasing amount of open content on the web. And I'm just going to say open content here. I just mean open to read. I don't mean mm -hmm. the sort of more canonical definitions from Budapest, which were also about like the right to remix and copyright is essentially right. nothing but public. Like I'm not going there. I'm just saying like you can actually read it without having to log in or have a subscription. Well, that's fine, but somebody is still supporting a platform. That I think is where the most interesting questions are sitting because those platforms are now moving from being only delivery platforms to also being production platforms. And I know you, Brian, have been following the Scholarly Kitchen, but for people who haven't, Roger Schoenfeld's doing some, has been doing some very interesting writing about this whole idea of the researcher platform. We're basically increasingly companies that we think of as being publishers are actually now platforms. And Elsevier is the one that's the easiest to see here, where they are basically attempting an end-to-end, -end, I had an idea, it got published, then metrics from there. Um, where And what Roger is pointing out is that these research platforms are increasingly kind of locking into each other. And um, it looks like it's going to continue. And at the moment, there's um, basically two companies in the research, the really like big scale research platform kind of space, which are digital science and Elsevier. There's a sort of question out there about the future of Springer Nature, which at one point was sort of joined with, with digital science and then was spun off. And they're currently in the process of um, preparing an IPO. Um, there's a lot of speculation back and forth of whether digital science and Springer Nature might ever join back up. Um, but regardless, we've got digital science and Elsevier as a platform with Elsevier still being also a publisher and the moment digital science not, but Springer Nature out there. Um, so there's just a whole lot of this sort of like, um, the other thing that's happening with this for libraries is that increasingly those platforms are not sold to libraries, they are sold to other people on campus. And so, um, that's an interesting question if you just want to take it from the library's perspective of the degree that to which we are being increasingly disintermediated and the degree to which um, some of the values that libraries insist on as part of those scholarly platforms or scholarly publishing, like the right to anonymity, um, the protection of intellectual freedom, some of those sorts of things might not be um, the top list of things from other campus units that might choose instead to have things like um, security or trackable use <laughs> as their top priorities. And I mean, I think all of these things are important and it's all about where do you, how do you balance them and where, which do you privilege more? Um, 
And so in addition to just sort of the disintermediation and maybe I have a, a stake in my profession continuing to exist, um, there are also questions about how this impacts the kinds of tools that scholars and students are able to, to use and what they're able to do on them. Let's, let me just, let me just pause for a second here because we've got a question coming from Michael Haggins and uh, Tara, why don't you uh, put him up on stage? Um, let me just, just some a couple of quick points that you made while Michael's coming up. One is, mm -hmm. let me second the vote for uh, Roger Schoenfeld because Roger is a raving genius, someone who always pays attention to. <laughs> Um, then there's also the idea of the researcher platform, and there's two things here. One is the shift, in, the shift from consumption to production, as we've discovered in digital literacy, um, but also this um, the sense of disintermediation, where the uh, and we've seen this in other fields beyond libraries, where uh, third-party providers will approach individuals on campus rather than the institution. These are very, very large trends. Uh, Michael, can you hear us and see us already? I can. Can you hear me? Excellent. Perfectly. Great. Welcome. Hi. Um, well, wonderful topic. And uh, I appreciate the complexity of the changing platforms and all the rest of that. My question comes from a different place. Uh, that is that the library for undergraduate students is a place and has been for a thousand years, we'll say. Uh, how do you see that? Uh, has changed in your career so far and how do you see that changing from the undergraduate perspective Good question. sure that is a great question so it's an interest i mean it uh, from 2006 to 2009, I was the head of the undergraduate library here at the University of Illinois. So I always have a special um, place in my heart for this notion of what does it mean to provide a space that privileges the undergraduate students, um, which is not to say that they can't use our other libraries. And it's also not to say that faculty can't use and grad students can't use the undergraduate library. In case, in, in, and in reality, they often did. Um, I always will admit to enjoying just a little bit when they would write to me and make a suggestion about ways to make the undergraduate library more friendly to non-undergraduate student populations, in which I mostly declined. Um, uh, so you are absolutely correct. Library as place is hugely important to undergraduate students and remains so. Um, whether it's LibQual, um, the ARL Library User Survey, or it's the Ithaca SNR Undergraduate Student Survey, repeatedly and in every user study, it's very clear that the library as place is very important to students. Now, one of the things we have to figure out is a place for what? <laughs> okay, mm -hmm. so um, that I think we see change in. So. Um, we see definitely a change um, from the solitary study space to the collaborative study space. Um, so when I was at the head of the undergraduate library, for example, we removed about 80% of our study carols that literally had you in a little box. Um, <laughs> and we brought in soft seating, more soft seating um, with you know the, the tables that have the, the laptop support. Um, so also more support for mobile computing. And by mobile, I mean everything from a laptop to you know the smallest, tiniest screen that you're wearing on your wrist. But primarily we were looking at the laptop, which was the, the thing that students were particularly wanting us to support. Um, so I think that's the the big thing. I mean, the other just sort of reality is not library specific, um, but in general, undergraduate students need a space to congregate and to gather. Um, their living arrangements, even if they're living on campus, are not necessarily that kind of space. Um, and then if they're off campus, of course, they need a space on campus because they are coming here. Now, I'm speaking, obviously, from a very um, residential campus perspective. So I want to tell you also, though, that early, late last fall, I was doing a study on information literacy misconceptions, which are things students believe about doing library research that aren't true. <laughs> so, but in the process of doing that, I did some focus groups with librarians and a number of the librarians were at institutions that were completely non-residential, 
and a couple that were even completely online, although they had a physical presence. So there was a campus, it's just none of the classes were taught face-to-face. All of those librarians also reported that the students desperately need a space to congregate and work together. <laughs> um, and even in these non, and especially in these non-residential ones that were highly non-residential, the students don't even have residence on campus as an option. And you might recall, um, I think it was early last year, it might have been in 2016, there was a great study that came out in New York City out of the, the CUNY system that actually looked at um, the degree to which students were doing schoolwork while on public transportation. And um, very fascinating. And like the degree to which we need to think about supporting transportation-based space <laughs> studying. I'm getting a little far afield here. Um, so, no, so fascinating to me. No, <laughs> but I mean, I, it's just fascinating how students are doing, like mixing their lives, right? So, well, you know, this is the big thing. So students need a space to study and congregate. Now you could still say, but why the library? because you know there's student unions there's i mean like why not just put lounges in each one of the classroom buildings so first of all we need those spaces too because with 30,000 undergraduate students on our campus the library actually physically can't have them all coming to the library so this isn't an either or this is a when or an, and how do we make sure we have the full range of spaces so students definitely value having access to expertise um, so our undergraduate library hosts not just the library, but also the writing center for campus. Um, we have a media commons where they can get media production facilities and the like. Students also in many studies have reported that it is an important thing for them to be in the library because the library is a space in which they, I'm going to just use some quotes, I feel smart. I feel like I'm a scholar when I'm here. I, this is where I go when I need to do serious studying. So not the unserious studying. I'm, but th they're clearly saying that there's something about being in this space that reflects upon how I see myself and also how others see me. So they will say things like, my friends know that if I'm studying at the library, they really shouldn't interrupt me. But if right. I'm studying at the student union, it's okay to interrupt me. So it's not just a sort of sense of self, which is important, but it's also a presentation of self to others. Then there's mm -hmm. just the reality that sometimes we literally have stuff that they need. Like either we have media materials that are on reserve or they need right. equipment that we provide. So, I mean, that's that's the obvious space stuff that like no one's going to be surprised by. But to me, what's interesting is when students basically have competing space choices. There's the coffee shop. There's the student union. There's the residence hall. There's whatever. There are times they are choosing library spaces and why do they choose those? And therefore, and then the question becomes, and are we providing the things that they need? Or are there times when they're coming to us hoping for something and we don't have it? And so I'll give you an example of that. When I was head to the undergraduate library, in the first like three months I was there, the staff sort of offhand said to me, oh, it's that time of year again when students ask if we have graphing calculators. <laughs> Now, I wasn't, I'm not a math person. I I regret this now in my life as I find more and more math important to my life. But, um, and I was like, how much does a graphing calculator cost? Because I'm thinking, are we talking like $4,000? Like, right? And they were like, they're $80. And I was like, let's buy five. <laughs> like, clearly you. students were saying, this is a place I want to come and do my collaborative school work that requires a graphing calculator. I don't know what that was, but, and, and part of it is whether they want to carry their expensive graphing calculator around to them, because remember their backpack goes with them to the Their Oops. backpack might go with her so far that it takes her offline. Um, we're going to bring her right back. Um, Michael, that was such a great question that it removed her from the video. No, no, no. Um, now here she comes back again. Michael, where are you today? St. Louis. Excellent. Excellent. 
<laughs> their backpack fun. goes with them to their part-time job, <laughs> to class, to the gym. So Perfect. what you want to be carrying around with you is essentially less stuff and maybe also not the expensive stuff that if it gets stolen is going to be a real problem for you. And so, you know, there's a great example where for, I don't know, it was like $300 we turned and I was, I was like, so what I asked my staff to do is, can you keep track of the things that you have to say no to? Like, no, we don't. And like, let's bring those to our monthly staff meeting and look at them. And, you know, some things we say no to for good reasons, because sometimes they're also asked in jest. But other things you're like, oh, like they actually need this. And this wouldn't be hard. In fact, I don't have any objection to doing this. It just never occurred to me. So, um, you know, some of those sorts of things. I will tell you, we also kept the typewriters going because we were the only place on campus that a typewriter could be used by anyone. It was really kind of charming. We taught many, many a millennial to use a typewriter. Michael, you well, I really appreciate. I really appreciate the um, uh, that that discussion, and uh, I would only add that I find that the library and the librarians frequently are the only people within an institution that have the ability to cut horizontally across and touch the whole place. And so that's why I find their survival, health, and navigation through the technological and financial challenges that you were talking about before uh -huh. to be tied to the health and uh, well-being of these institutions going forward. Um, so that's my that's Well, my I won't disagree with that. The, the importance of <laughs> okay. libraries. Thank so you. So we have a you know, value. Well, thank, yeah. thank you for a great question. Yeah, thank you. Uh, we, have a, we have more questions uh, that are piling in. And uh, Great. everybody, you can see how easy it is for people to join uh, on video. Uh, we had a, a text question, I think, from, uh, I'm going to say, Ashford, Robin Ashford. Let's see if we flash that on the screen. Mm -hmm. uh, it's coming. At our academic library, we do lease access to the majority of our ebooks. However, we do outright purchase and own a number of unlimited simultaneous user ebooks from publishers as well. Uh, I'm curious, in the, in the, library ebook world, what proportion is that? I mean, what proportion are viable and what proportion are leasable right now? You know, honestly, I ha I don't know those statistics off the top of my head. I know that there are some publishers that um, have decided that that's their business model is to work on that basis, which is to not put single user restrictions on things. Um, and so whether licensed or purchased, so there's two questions here, because there's license versus purchase, and then there's right. single user or right. unlimited, or single, and there's single to unlimited, because there's some things where we don't have like a single user license, we have a multiple user license, but it caps out. Or another version is, um, it, is that we, it's a package and in that package up to a hundred uses can be made simultaneously, but it could be a hundred uses of one book or it could be one use of a hundred books. So there's a lot, again, complexity and you know, which of these we prefer as a library often depends a lot on our curriculum, the way, how large our campus is, um, the degree to which right. we anticipate those books being used as classroom texts. And some publishers are thrilled to have their books used as classroom texts and others work very hard to prevent it from being used as a classroom text. So it's this is where it gets very difficult. And in fact, we see, especially in the realm of licensing, uh, sometimes publishers will try something out and discover that they lose a lot of money and then they just no longer offer that license the next year. So You're this pretty, is uh, very that, continuously really. changes. Sorry. That's the negotiations um, that's we a, do. That's <laughs> a great question. Uh, Robin, yeah. uh, with a terrific answer. We have another question here from uh, Kristen Eshelman. Hi, like Kristen. Let's push this on the screen. I'm not convinced that talking about the library as a space where academic work gets done would be enough to keep the work as a high funding priority. How do we talk best about librarians? Mm -hmm. uh, it's interesting. So, 
Yeah. So absolutely, because there's a there's a there's an interesting thing here, which is that part of it is it's not obvious why students are using the library, right? So like that thing I just talked about is we have to tell the story about why library space is important. But the other thing we need to do is understand that um, library as space and library as service are not the same thing. And historically, those two were very tied together. You could only get library service in library space. Now you can do library service on your phone with Ask a Librarian. I mean, we had the telephone. I mean, I'm not going back too far here. But um, <laughs> although it's interesting, by the way, to go back to read to when libraries like started offering service on the phone and the way it was going to destroy all of civilization, but kind of like how the internet was going to destroy libraries too. Um, we have to pivot and shift and think about these things. But you know, the first question and now this one, I think also gives me a chance to talk a little bit about something that's really near and dear to my heart, sort of on a professional national level as opposed to institutional. So when I was president of the Association of College and Research Libraries from 2010 to 2011, my initiative was the value of academic libraries. And we've done a lot of things since then, seven years of work, we've released, you know, an incredible amount of research that was done through a grant we were able to garner where more than almost 200 libraries did assessment and evaluation projects to show the linkage between library services, collections, and spaces with student learning and success. And so we have empirical findings about the importance of library for student learning and success. What we haven't done, I think, is as articulated as well, the degree to which um, those are outcomes of services and services depend on staffing and not just a physical. And this is one of the challenges, right? Because it's the same issue as like, the sociology department doesn't teach classes, faculty teach classes for the sociology department. And we have, we have some unpacking to do there, but by and large, what we know from the studies that we did of these 200 is it's services that are provided by um, skilled workers, trained librarians, academic professionals, IT people working in libraries that have the impact on student learning and success. And the library as space is a certainly kind of like an infrastructural service, if you will, but it's not the service that sort of makes the strategic difference with student learning and success. So it's a, it's a, That's tricky. It's, it's a very tricky conversation to have. Um, and and so this i mean this is the work of leadership in libraries mm -hmm. is to is to articulate these things to use the evidence that we have for not only developing services in libraries but also at the advocacy work of explaining because we have this first year instruction program which by the way, means we need to have eight graduate students as well as four librarians in our undergraduate library or whatever the numbers are, this is the impact it has. If you want that impact, you want first year students to be prepared with skills necessary so that they can succeed in their future research classes, then we have to staff this program. Now, if you don't care whether students can do research, well, first we're gonna argue about whether you should care, but let's say you ultimately say, well, I don't care. Well then of course, cut those staff, right? But like the point here is you can't say you care about students learning to do research and then cut the program that is what helps them learn to do research. And that is the librarians and our library staff. And I'm just, as long as we understand the word librarians to mean kind of the full complement, because it's not just the MLS holding librarians who make a difference here. It's our staff who also work with students. It's our graduate assistants. It's our IT professionals. I mean, this is a, this is an ecosystem of employees, not just the singular librarian. So as long as we remember that libraries and programs are like soil and green made out of people. Um, <laughs> it's really okay. vital. Um, <laughs> kind of by analogy, um, maybe. <laughs> yeah. Oh, we, have a, we have a question from uh, Roxanne Riskin, who can't join us on stage right now, but has a text question. Um, yes. What are your librarians interested in researching for their own professional interests? So this goes back oh, to, yeah. to one of your, your many hats about doing mm -hmm. professional development. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, with eight, 
Yeah, with 80 librarians here, I mean, we have librarians researching a full range of things. I mean, we have the one of the world's international experts on leather bindings of and preserving mm. leather bindings of special collections materials. Um, she, you know, Jennifer Hain Tepper, she's um, the head of our preservation conservation, um, brilliant research that she's done. Um, and it's bench research, it's lab research. It's, it's looking at the chemistry of what causes leather bindings to decay and how do you stop that? And, and if you do have something that has decayed, how do you repair it? Um, so, you know, we have that. Um, we have, um, my my collaborator Bill Michaud and Michael Norman and I have worked a lot on our discovery interfaces, which is a lot about interface design, human computer interaction kinds of questions, usability. I mentioned that last semester I was working on a project um, to look at information literacy misconceptions among our student learners. The head of the instruction program in the undergraduate library, which is the program that reaches our our first year composition students. Regard, we have about five different ways you can do composition here, but she, she works with all those programs. About 3,000 students a year come through her program. Um, you know, she was looking at um, ESL learners when they're in the rhetoric classroom and they're learning to write and how that ESL population experiences the library instruction that we provide and whether our instruction is as successful for the ESL learners as it is for uh, native English learners. And, you know, she did this incredible right. research into this. And, 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 you know, one of the things we discovered is that actually this exercise that they use, which is concept mapping is really helpful for ESL learners and for native learners, but in some interestingly kind of unexpected ways. So, you know, so many things that, that are going on. The other thing that that I personally also, um, oh, I we also have somebody doing this amazing work with veterans and their information needs when they, you know, a lot of people who are veterans, college comes after some really intensive life experiences. And, <laughs> you know, what are their information needs, both as scholars as well as veterans? And she's doing some amazing research around that, as well as users with disabilities. So I mean, I, I like I can just I'm like I'm like my head is going through my colleagues, and I'm like, oh, and she does copyright, and oh my gosh, she's doing so much with, you know, collection usage statistics, and oh, I forgot we're doing this thing about how you. Um, I have a colleague who's like the one of the world's experts in graphic novels and comics from India and how we nice. collect those and understand them. So, <laughs> just, da, 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 so I sh I'll stop. Just, well, this, uh, Roxanne, that's a great question. And, and Lisa, what a rich answer. What a great population you work with. It reminds me mm -hmm. of Michael's point about the library cutting horizontally uh, across campus. Yeah, oh, absolutely. We, we're, we're almost out of time, and we have a, a question from uh, Tom, I think Tom Hames. If we just flash that on the screen, we've got, um, what is the most important identifier of library success? What is the key rubric? Oh. <laughs> Uh, yeah. So, I mean, I, I, I both, I'll answer it in sort of an unsatisfiery, like very generic way, and then I'll try and, you know, so, I mean, the most important identifier of library success is that we contribute to the goals and outcomes that our institutions are trying to achieve. And so if we're an academic library at a research university, that's going to be a certain set of institutional outcomes. Um, if we're at a community college, that might be a different set of institutional outcomes, though, of course, we can see patterns and the like. And some forthcoming research, actually, that I'll point you to that isn't out yet, but um, uh, Ithaca SNR, Roger Schoenfeld, who's already been mentioned, um, and OCLC, which is a very important library platform provider for book catalog and uh, holdings data of libraries around the country, actually around the world, they have been collaborating on a research project to look at sort of the service profile of different libraries based on the types of institutions they're at. So what does a library need to be like if it's at a certain kind of institution, not just based on um, sort of our traditional sense of type, but also based on priority, like technical learning or academic learning or transfer, or those sorts of things. So I'm, I'm very much anticipating and looking forward to that research. Um, so other key rubrics, I mean, there's also rubrics at the level of sort of efficiencies um, that libraries really have to be working at, right? Like we have to be looking at just 
you know, what does it take for us to get an e-journal up and running on our platforms and can we make that more efficient? So there's impact rubrics that we can be talking about and metrics, which are going to be around student learning and success, faculty research and productivity, institutional quality ranking, those sorts of things, and how we align and contribute to those. But there's also internal metrics that have to do with, okay, but can we get more efficient? Um, you know, and efficiencies can even be at an institution like mine, like, there's a reason that we have graduate students who are at our main service points where we can predict that a certain percentage of the questions don't need a, you know, a, a librarian with 25 to 30 years of experience in order to answer those questions. Um, but we still need mechanisms then. If we're not going to put our most highly paid people at the desk, how do you get people to right. those experts when they need to get there. So these kind of logistics and operational questions are as important in the sense if we're going to have the impacts we want to have, because we can only grow our effectiveness impacts, if you will, okay. if we are also growing our efficiency impacts or metrics. So internally you have like efficiency. That. Well, right. internally you have efficiency metrics and then externally the institutional alignment. I, I, I hate to, I hate to yeah. rush things because we had two more questions and we're almost in the time. Oh. Tom, thank you for that uh, elegant question. This is, we have one from, uh, I want to say, Elaine Marshall. Let's see if that's right. Uh, have you tried flipping the instructions so they can pause, rewind, and master the concepts and vocabulary for ESL students? Uh, good question. Right. Yeah. So um, it's, it's, they definitely are. I mean, Susan's always experimenting with a huge amount of pedagogy. Is, um, one of the challenges we have here is our ESL students are not necessarily in ESL specific sections. And so uh, um, uh. just just as context here, we have we're a 40,000 student campus and we have 5,000 international students. Now, not all international students are necessarily ESL and some domestic students actually uh -huh. are ESL, but so um, this isn't necessarily meaning that they're in remedial classes, they're often integrated. And so, and we're not doing it online, we're doing it face to face, but we are, I mean, we have very heavy libguide development and electronic resource development. And Susan's also authored components of the textbooks that students are using in their classes for some locally published textbooks that we have. One of the courses is a, is a local published textbook that's custom to our class. And so she's got a chapter in there. So there are a lot of things we're doing to try and to, to address those very issues. Well, that's a, a great question. Another case for research. Again, you have mm -hmm. librarians doing research and producing content. Um, right. One of the things that's great about us here is that our research does drive our practice and vice versa, right? We really are able to capitalize on the fact that we're scholars and doing this investigation to actually improve our services. Well, let me, let me ask one question to, to wrap things up. This is, this might blow things out the door instead. Um, <laughs> I, I think with the many, many technologies that libraries work with, what do you see some of the impacts of rapidly advancing artificial intelligence in libraries. That is, do you think libraries will, libraries will have to train faculty in how to use AI to conduct research or train students to conduct research that way? Do, do you see AI competing with librarians for certain functions? You know, I, I, so I'm gonna assume that when you say AI, you're gonna, you're gonna do like the AI and machine learning conglomeration there yeah, because yeah, some of it I think is actually yeah 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 well, it's, so, um, it's, one big, yeah, one big yeah. it's kind of that mass of things so first of all I want to say uh, if you really want to hear a long answer to that uh, spring 2017 CNI conference I had I convened a panel on this topic so there's an hour-long discussion it was videotaped you can listen to it there um, so a couple things we're starting to see these kinds of labs brought up in libraries. In fact, the University of Rhode Island Library just this week announced the opening of their AI lab in their library. So first of all, libraries are becoming places for people to learn this. Second thing, in our collections are actually um, rich sources of content that actually can drive machine learning and drive artificial intelligence. So these you know, they have to learn off something. <laughs> and so thinking, uh, librarians are increasingly challenged to think about how do we create our collections such that they're not just accessible and discoverable by the human reader researcher, but how are they gonna be accessible and, and ex discoverable for the 
robot researcher. So um, do we need to structure data differently for them? The answer is yes. Um, finally, I have long, long thought that we could use some sort of machine learning or very rudimentary bot-like technologies in libraries for some very basic questions. Um, you know, and there was there are bots in libraries in other countries. Um, there was one famously in Germany, actually. Uh, you know, in the in 1990s, um, it's Stella. She's been taken offline now and not maintained. Um, but you know, could answer basic questions about hours and do you own this book? And um, so, I do think that that is just has to come as far as efficiencies because we have so much to do that. Um, you know, if we, you know, what are we going to peel off and automate? And libraries have always been early automators. Um, you know, library, yep. libraries automated their book collections long before anyone else automated their inventory. So we're always early automators. We're often early adopters of these technologies. So I anticipate seeing a lot of this come sooner rather than library. <laughs> sooner rather than library. Oh. Sooner rather than oh. later. Sooner rather than later. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. So, um, Liz, yeah. I, I, I hate to pause this. And we have a series of questions coming up, but we are really out of time. Out of time. Uh, we've just had a rich, rich hour. Um, you have covered so many topics. I'm really, really grateful to you. Um, and I'm really, really impressed at how well you answered all these really provocative questions from uh, forum participants. Um, we're going to have to bring you back just to continue this conversation. Because oh, I'd, love so I'd love it. I'd love it. Thank you. Thank you again, and please stay warm. Okay, and if I can just also say, as always with anything please. that I do like this, if people would like to follow up, it's very easy to find me online, okay. but I also have been online enough that I actually have the username Lisa Librarian on Twitter and on Gmail. So um, I'm happy for people to get in touch and uh, ask their questions one-on-one -on -one too, if there was anything that they were really hoping to get to and we couldn't. Follow Lisa Librarian, definitely, definitely. Um, <laughs> Well, stick around for a minute if you can. Um, but now we have to put up a couple of slides to describe where we're going next week because we have a lot to talk about. Um, again, thank you, friends, for covering a, a wide range of territory um, for thinking about the library and where it could be changing. Uh, next week, we're going to shift ground to the topic of net neutrality. Uh, we have one of the leading activists and experts in this field. Uh, Jared Cummings is the Director of Policy and Cover of Relations for Educause, and he'll be talking about what is happening with neutrality in education and where we can take it. This is a huge subject. I'm really delighted to have Jared with us. Please come with us uh, next week for that. Um, also coming up, uh, we have uh, our online book club, which has finally settled on our topic. Uh, our book coming up is called Soonish. Um, it's by a wonderful pair of writers. It's about 10 technologies coming up. So please take a look at Soonish, and I'll have a blog post about our schedule coming right up. And in the meantime, if books and next week is enough to think about, you can go to ftte.us to learn more about the Future Trends Report, or go to shindig.com to learn more about the technology that we've just used. Let me thank everybody for your time, your questions, your reflections, and your thoughts. Until next week, see you later. Thanks again. Bye-bye.